everyone. Welcome to today's event. Uh, my name is uh, Greg Ball. I'm the Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences here at the University of Maryland College Park. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to uh, today's uh, event on Islamophobia and the American election. Uh, this event is uh, being led by the Sadat Chair in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, Professor Shibli Talhami, and we're co-sponsoring it with our colleagues in the School of Public Policy, in particular the Center for International and Security Studies at Maryland. You know, this election that we're in the middle of now has been said by many to be quite different than any other election that any of us can remember. Certainly, in my case, uh, that is true. And one issue that has emerged in this election is how America thinks about its minority, how it thinks about the different types of people that make up this country. And although we all recognize that this is a tremendous strength of our country, in this election it's dismaying that we have yet again people questioning in ways are welcoming to immigrants and are embracing of, of ethnic diversity and celebrating as the strength of America. And one of the most important issues relates to how Islam is viewed in this country. And I couldn't be more pleased that uh, Professor Talhami and his colleagues of what we're now gonna call the Maryland Critical Issues Poll. Uh, this is led by Professor Talhami and the co-director is Professor Stella Rouse in the uh, Government and Politics Department. They are gonna be collecting data, as you'll hear about today, concerning issues like this that are important to the American people, and one of the great strengths is that uh, Professor Tahami is one of the few people who's assessing these things in other parts of the world, like the Middle East. So this is exactly the kind of thing that the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences is proud to be involved in, and it's very appropriate for the Sadat Chair for Peace to be investigating things, collecting information, helping us to understand the situation, and to think about things we can do about it as we move forward in this very complex world we face today. I'd now like to call on my colleague from the Public Policy School, Professor Gallagher, to uh, take the next. Hi, I'm Nancy Gallagher. I'm the Interim Director of the Center for International and Security Studies at the School of Public Policy. And we've been working in collaboration with Chibley and others over uh, many years, um, basically looking at the intersection of public attitudes and security policy, foreign policy, um, so we've done a number of studies looking at American attitudes towards uh, issues in the Middle East, including the Iran nuclear deal with our colleague Steve Cull, among others, who's here. Um, and we've also looked some at the role of particularly Americans' religious beliefs in how they see critical issues in global security. Um, we've collaborated on a number of things with Shibley over the years, and so I'm delighted to be able to join him in co-sponsoring this event. Uh, we've got basically three people who are going to comment on his findings, um, talking about how basically what's going on in the American election regarding Islamophobia looks from the perspectives of countries that they grew up in, that they study, that they understand very well. Um, and Dr. Talhami is going to present the research first, but let me work backwards a little bit and tell you who our commentators are, um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about Dr. Talhami. Uh, Dr. Neil Sugoran is a research scholar at CISM. Uh, she's also one of our recent PhD students, so we're very proud of her. Uh, she wrote her dissertation on Turkish security policy, uh, particularly around nuclear issues. And she's also worked at several other research centers, including the START Center here on campus, and taught at Koch University in Istanbul. Um, Dr. Sahar Khamis is professor in the Department of Communications at the University of Maryland. She's an expert on Arab and Muslim media uh, and a former head of the Mass Communication and Information Science Department at Qatar University. She's co-authored a number of books. Um, she's also interest, particularly interesting to me, a human rights commissioner in the Human Rights Commission in um, Montgomery County, Maryland, so she's able to talk about how it looks to immigrant communities here as well, um, and has a monthly radio show on U.S. Arab radio. Uh, our third commentator will be uh, Fatima Kazaraz, director of the Russian Institute for Persian Studies and a professor in the School of Language, Literature, and Culture here. She was born and raised uh, in the city of Shiraz, Iran, um, and has spent 
most of her professional life uh, here in the United States, um, both at, the, at Washington University in St. Louis and now here at the University of Maryland. Uh, in addition to extensive academic scholarship, she's a published poet in Persian and English and an activist for peace and justice, including having won the Herschel Walker Peace and Justice Award. So um, the three of them will be presenting three different perspectives on what's going on here, but to tell you what's going on here, um, you know, Dr. Telhami, the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development here in um, the School of Behavioral Science and Social Sciences, um, and a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings Institution He's written a number of books on different aspects of policy in the Middle East and U.S. policy towards the Middle East. He served as an advisor to a number of government initiatives concerned with basically U.S. policy towards the Middle East. Um, he's, on the State De he's been on the State Department's advisory group on public diplomacy for the Arab and Muslim world. Uh, he's been working most recently, he's done an, a lot of work um, on basically attitudes in um, the Middle East, including collecting data for the Arab Public Opinion Survey since 2002 in six Arab countries. Now he's also working on a project looking at American attitudes towards the Middle East, and the work that he's gonna be presenting today is related to that project. Uh, thanks, Dean Ball. Thanks, Nancy. It's really a pleasure to um, co-sponsor this with CISM. Always uh, fun to work together. Uh, and I'm also honored to be uh, joined uh, later by my co-panelists who uh, have uh, really interesting expertise and a lot of information to bring uh, into the conversation. Um, before I present the data, I just want to say a couple of things about the theme. So it's called Islamophobia, but uh, as you know, that's a particularly complicated term to define. So we're not gonna get into the anatomy of the word. So what we really are going to do in this panel, just to be clear, is the American conversation about Islam and Muslims uh, and uh, the conversation in Muslim majority countries, Arab and, and other Muslim countries about that. Uh, so basically how people perceive Islam and Muslims, how are we talking about this issue in general? Uh, and so put aside the term Islamophobia, it may come up in the discussion, uh, what it means, but rather than get into the analysis of the term, the, understand that what, the substance of what we're talking about is the conversation that we're having in our election about Islam and Muslims and the conversations that is being had in, in Arab and Muslim countries. So let me tell you, first of all, what I'm gonna to present to you today. I'm gonna to present to you very briefly so that we really focus more on the conversation uh, is results of three polls I've done over the past year uh, throughout our election campaign. And in part, uh, these are part of larger polls. I'm not gonna talk about all of the polls, but we've had aspects trying to figure out how American attitudes toward Islam and Muslims is changing in the middle of our discourse uh, in a heated uh, uh, political campaign. And so I've done a lot of polling in the past on this issue, but I wanted to see very closely how this has evolved. So I have three polls, one in November of last year, you know, sort of the beginning of our campaign, then one in, uh, in, in May, and then one in June right after the Orlando shootings because we thought that would have kind of consequences and we wanted to probe that a little bit more. And as a matter of fact, we're, we just finished another poll that we're gonna release uh, in the event that uh, Dean Ball talked about on November 1st. We have uh, the launch of our new center uh, in Vsauce, uh, uh, the critical issues poll, which probes both domestic politics and foreign policy. And we're going to release a large poll including about our elections and where we stand just a week before uh, election day, uh, as well as race issues, uh, policy towards Syria, policy toward ISIS, American priorities, and also attitudes toward Islam and Muslims that we're talking about uh, uh, today. Uh, and I'll, I'll say something brief about it because I glanced at the data last night and we have some additional information that I could bring uh, uh, into this as well. Um, so. 
obviously, one of the questions that we've had is, has the heated campaign, where at least many of the candidates, certainly on the Republican side, it's not just Donald Trump, but many of the candidates have uh, really spoken with, uh, spoken language that many have interpreted to be anti-Muslim uh, across the board. Uh, and certainly the fear of immigrants and the fear of refugees. Uh, and and uh, 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 one of the candidates' suggestion of, quote, keeping all Muslims out until we figure out what's going on. So we wanted to see whether that kind of heated debate had an impact on American attitudes toward Islam and Muslims. And the results uh, are surprising, very surprising. Let me just show you uh, one of the questions that we have been tracking for a while, which is whether people's attitude toward the Muslim people are favorable or unfavorable. Uh, uh, somewhat favorable, very favorable, somewhat unfavorable, very unfavorable. And so um, before, um, if you have any questions about the methodology, certainly you can ask me. I'm not going to go through it now. These are our fielding partner is Nielsen Scarborough, uh, one of the finest. In fact, we have the representative here uh, uh, participating today. Uh, and um, this is, these are pretty good size um, uh, polls. The, the one in, in May, for example, was uh, uh, 1580. Uh, the one in, uh, in June was uh, 1312. They're national representative um, sample selected from uh, Nielsen's probabilistic uh, panel uh, and is conducted uh, over the internet. Um, so let me just go with this one question. What is your attitude about each of the following? The Muslim people. And here are the breakdown, November, May, and uh, then post Orlando, June. So I want you to look at these lines. So the black line is November, the green line is May, the purple line is June. And look at the progression. Uh, this is the everyone, all Americas. So it goes from 53% favorable views in November to 58 favorable views in May, in the middle of our heated campaign, and then it goes further up to 62% uh, uh, after Orlando, after the shooting. And this was done a week after the shooting. We, we did that, we went right to the field. Nielsen, was so, Nielsen Scarborough was so great to work with us to feel this instantly to get a before and after kind of result. And so uh, look at this interesting result, certainly not what people would have expected. Now, here's one of the stories, of course, of this. If you break it down by party, of course, one of the, one of the biggest stories about our politics on almost every issue is how polarized it's become. So uh, particularly the division between Democrats and Republicans. So if you look at Democrats in the middle, Republicans on top, and independents at the bottom, what happened is that the Democrats' views and the independents' views have improved dramatically over that period. But the views of Republicans didn't change. Didn't change, stayed where they were, roughly where they were, 41% to 42%, 58% to 57%, uh, unfavorable. It didn't change. So the change happened along partisan lines in the middle of a political campaign. And in fact, uh, I'll show you in a minute when you uh, view it uh, 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 along uh, the, the uh, breakdown for Clinton supporters versus Trump supporters. So if you look at it there, just for the two polls, May and June, um, uh, you can see that um, Clinton supporters' views went from uh, favorable 74 to 82. Uh, Trump's went unfavorable from 63 to 66. Uh, still within the margin of error, but, but that's the, the trend. But look at the bottom line comparison. If you look, the, look at, if you, if you just look, for example, at either the May numbers or the June numbers, the 82% in June of Clinton supporters had a favorable view of Muslims versus 34% of Trump's. It's 48% difference. In fact, on attitudes toward Islam and Muslims, the gap between Democrats and Republicans uh, uh, is larger than on almost any other issue. 
and almost any other issue, including abortion, gun control, it is really quite remarkable how, much, how divided America is on this issue. Uh, and, and this is obviously telling a story here. Um, now, let me just um, move over to um, this one question um, that I wanted you to look at. So we ask people whether or not they know some Muslims. Not whether they have friends, whether they know some Muslims. Well, yes, but not well, or don't know any Muslims at all. And we correlated their views uh, with, you know, we, we did a cross tabs of the, with, with their views on, on, on both Muslim people and the Muslim religion. And it's common sense, but look how wonderfully it breaks down. So uh, people who um, don't know any Muslim have the least favorable view. People who know some Muslims but not well have better view. People who know some Muslims very well have the best views. And that, by the way, breaks down as well, I'm, I don't have the slide here, but it works the same way across parties. So that's true for Republicans, it's true for Democrats, it's true for independents. So it's a fascinating story. Obviously, it's something that seems common sense, uh, that people, it normalizes uh, the view, but, but still, it's very nice to see this breaking out uh, the way one would expect uh, in the data. Uh, what is your attitude about each of the following? The Muslim religion, Islam. And we have found that there, people do have different views about Islam and Muslims. They're not identical. And uh, Americans have had a more favorable view of the Muslim people than Islam, uh, really dating back to as far as we could measure, but certainly since 9-11. Uh, and, um, and we can discuss that. I want to get into why that's the case. That's something certainly we could bring up in the conversation. But, at, but that has been true. And you can see it here as well. So for example, in the November poll, the black uh, up there, uh, only 37% had a favorable view of, Muslim, of Islam, of, of the Muslim religion in November. That improved to 42% in May and then to 44% uh, in June. So if you look at the overall change, 37 to 44, it's a pretty significant uh, change. Uh, again, uh, if you break it down by party, you find that Democrats and independents' views of the Islam have Im improved uh, across the three polls, but the Republican views didn't change, remained the same. So again, the partisanship issue seems to drive a lot of that right there. Um, when you break it down by supporters, again, you get the same kind of division. So uh, in the November, in the, in the June poll, the purple, 84% of Trump supporters said they had an unfavorable view of Islam uh, uh, versus only 33% uh, of Clinton supporters who had a negative view of Islam. Again, that's a 51 percentage point. It's really quite remarkable uh, cha uh, difference. Uh, and on this issue, again, uh, when you correlate uh, people who know Muslims with attitudes toward Islam, you find that people who know Muslims tend to have a better view of Islam as well. And, and that goes, again, look at, the, look at the lines, very 37 to 44 to 55. Um, now, one other question that we ask in terms of attitudes toward Islam and Muslims uh, is whether or not people think the two are compatible in terms of value, whether Islam and the West are compatible in terms of values, what I call the clash of civilization argument, whether people agree with the clash of civilization or not. And so what we found is that we asked them to, to which, which one of the views closer to, to which, which one is closer to their position, uh, Islamic and Western rel uh, religious and social traditions are incompatible with each other, or most Muslims in the Western Islamic world have similar needs and wants, uh, et cetera. And so you can see, again, that uh, on this issue, more people said the two are compatible, which is the second choice, even in November, 
But that also increased over time, just like the rest of the other questions, from 57 to 61 to 64 percent. So interestingly, we had that change, and again, uh, not much change among Republicans, most of the change among Democrats and independents, the same story we have. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Clinton supporters think the two are compatible. Uh, Trump supporters think the two are not compatible. Now, before I give you the stuff on Orlando, I want to just give you some thought about, so what explains that? And I say what explains that because, frankly, you know, you don't have this kind of change in a period of few months uh, in an, under normal circumstances. And it's not as if you know, people haven't been thinking about Islam and Muslims uh, since at least 9-11. This has been a big story for us. This is not a fresh story that came just out of our election. This has been in the public uh, discourse for some time. So what explains that? Why, why is that happening? Uh, and I'll give you uh, the short answer and the long answer. The short answer is the one that explains the size of, of this change, which is significant. Uh, when you look at it from November uh, to June. And by the way, here's the hint that I will give you. In fact, the poll that we just finished, literally a couple of days ago, we just looked at the data. Uh, we asked the same questions, and we just, we haven't fully analyzed them, but I looked at them last night, and it looks like the same trend is continuing. So there's even further improvement in the current poll, in the October poll, over these three. So we, we know the trend is there. So what explains that trend? Uh, I believe that it's mostly the American political polarization, uh, by which I mean we are in an intense political season. And so everybody's invested in the narrative. Uh, Trump's opponents, uh, whether they're independents or Democrats, associate this anti-Islamic view with him, and to the extent that they reject him, they reject his view. That's number one. Number two, because we are in the middle of an intense campaign, uh, narratives uh, uh, are costly. So uh, if, if, if uh, Trump's narrative succeeds, Hillary's, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's narrative fails, uh, and Sanders' narrative fails, and President Obama's narrative fails, so in order to counter Trump, they have to counter his narrative on the issues that he's making front and center. So as a consequence, they were forced to formulate aggressive counter-narrative about no, Islam and the West are compatible. No, not all Muslims are terrorists. No, Islam uh, uh, is not the problem. And that counter-narrative obviously had an impact. So this is an unusual case because we're in the middle of the campaign. In the long term, though, there's also a slow process to change for the better. And that comes out of two things. One is that we've, we're over the period of 9-11, uh, up to a point. Obviously, that was intense. But when you look at the demographic change in America, all the groups that are the future of America, young people, millennials in particular, people who are connected globally, who use the internet, who, who have passports, who travel overseas, who have relatives overseas, who speak another language, um, ethnic groups like Hispanics who are expanding, they tend to have better views of Islam and Muslims uh, than the rest of the population, and that's, the, that's also the percentage that is growing. That's more of a long-term trend, in and of itself can't explain the size of the change. I also want to just briefly show you a couple of things. One is um, the, the fact that American public has a little bit more nuance, and because there was this battle of narrative, that nuance was forced into the public discourse. And so, when we, uh, if you recall the, f the, the first news of this horrific shooting in Orlando, you know, so many people got killed, innocent people got killed, and the guy obviously did it partly claiming uh, that he's doing it in, in the name of Islam. So there was no question that people were gonna make that link, and certainly was exploited in our political discourse. And yet when you ask people, uh, you know, uh, which of these is the most important factors. After, by the way, we asked them to evaluate each one of the factors that might be behind the Orlando shooting, uh, you find that 33%, uh, uh, only one-third say it was militant Islamic I ideology that was most important for uh, the Orlando shooting, shooter's behavior. You find another 
21% say mental illness or, or self-hate or, or hate for the LGB community, but not, uh, you know, his, his faith. And, um, and then when you ask um, uh, people about, so how do we, what, what should we do to reduce the chance of a shooting like we faced in Orlando, and you give them options to rank each one on a scale of zero to 10, you find the first one is banning the sale of weapons to terrorists and people on a criminal uh, uh, watch lists, better security at public venues, uh, fighting ISIS uh, or similar groups abroad, uh, banning the sale of, uh, of assault rifles, and then lastly, the, on, last on the list is closely monitoring mosques and Muslim American groups. So it's not something that the public is really very much uh, 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 focus on. And um, when you ask them to rank them directly, again, the same thing you, you find, uh, which one is most important, you find that uh, closely monitoring mosques and Muslim American groups is lost on that list. It's not, it's not what the public thinks of as the action that would prevent this kind of attack. So there's much more nuanced kind of analysis or the public has than we think or what the discourse uh, seems to suggest about that. Um, I want to also give you a couple of more quick ones related to refugees from the Middle East uh, where we ask questions about whether or not uh, in general uh, do you support or oppose the United States taking in refugees from conflicts in Syria and, and Middle Eastern countries after screening them for security risks. So we, we obviously added that and that's an important uh, addition because it, it, you, you'll see why in a minute. And so the, the bottom line is if you look at the total, uh, yes, the majority of Americans actually are open to accepting refugees from the Middle East. Uh, and uh, when you look at it, obviously break down Democrats, Republicans, Independents, then you, you find a huge difference where 62% uh, of Republicans are opposed, but 77% of Democrats uh, support. When you ask them, what is their biggest concern about absorbing refugees? Uh, they, 46% say it's fear of terrorism or concern about terrorism, and 41% say, say uh, um, concern about economic burden of absorbing refugees. So, uh, so the, obviously those are the two that are out there. And when you look at the security part, which is a big concern, uh, and you ask them, um, uh, in your estimation, how many refugees have been arrested since 9-11 of all the refugees, the hundreds of thousands of refugees that the United States has accepted since 9-11 from, from all over the world? How many do you believe uh, have been arrested uh, over terrorism charges? Uh, here's the answer. 28% uh, say 100 or more. 30% 30, uh, uh, 30 fewer than 100. Only 14% uh, say fewer than five. The answer, by the way, is three. And, and that gives you, again, a sense of where the public is. So I want to conclude with a more pessimistic note before I invite my co-panelists uh, for the conversation. Um, and um, and the, the pessimistic note is the following. Um, number one is that uh, even if you look at majority trends, the fact is when you have a heated campaign and you have passionate, uh, I don't want to say hate, but, but certainly passionate dislike and opposition to Muslim, all you need is minorities for people to feel it. And to feel it at the personal level, to feel it in school. So despite the trend that we see that overall looks rosy, the fact that you have intense minorities feeling perhaps more more hate uh, in, in, through, through our rhetoric is problematic. It's not something that could be dismissed. It doesn't, it's not about the numbers, it's also about intensity. And so the intensity of minority views matter a lot. And if you're a Muslim American or, uh, and, 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 and having to deal with that, you can feel it even if the majority is going your way. Uh, the second point I want to make is that despite all this improvement, and here is the number since 9-11, uh, we haven't even gotten back to the first few months after 9-11. In fact, 
uh, one poll that was taken right after 9-11, October 2001 by ABC News, had 47% of the American public having favorable views of the Muslim religion. And 39% had unfavorable views. Look at those unfavorable views. They went from 39% to 61% in, in 2011. That is, that's one that I did in 2011. And then they have improved slightly over the past um, uh, a few months. And they settled in June at 55% negative. So we're not back to where we were in, in so it's still, despite all the improvement that we're tracing, uh, views of Muslim religion are still more negative than positive. And uh, I want also to give you another one that is kind of uh, worrisome. Uh, so we, we inserted a question, in fact this one I have not released, this is the first time we released this particular uh, data, uh, which is assuming that you agree with the general position of the presidential candidates on issues that are important to you, would you vote for that candidate if he or she were evangelical Christian, Jewish American, Muslim American? I put that for comparison to see what, what, the, what people would say. And obviously, it's always a problem with this kind of question because there's going to be self-censorship. There's going to be different kind of attitudes. But nonetheless, we tested it to see what we get. And look at what we have. Um, with evangelicals, 17% uh, say they would not vote for an evangelical Christian presidential candidate, even if they agreed with them. Uh, with Jewish Americans, only 8% say they would not vote for a, a candidate uh, if they were Jewish, if they agree with them. With Muslim American, 34%, one third of the population say they would not vote for a Muslim president even if they agreed with their position. And that is not a good place to be. And with that, I would like to invite my colleagues to the stage and have a conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just, uh, if you could sit right there, and uh, you're next to her, and at the end, if you don't mind. Um, sorry, uh, Islamic or Muslim? No, it's the same term. It's the same, the same word. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, no, it, it's the same, uh, the same term. Uh, in, in, um, in Arabic, um, the word is Muslim. Um, uh, uh, that's, the, that's the term that is used for, to describe. Um, well, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Uh, I mean, obviously, um, uh, in some ways, uh, the, you know, we know what uh, the Arab world is discussing. Some of us appear on media in Muslim, con uh, on, on, in Muslim countries, Arab countries, uh, and we know this issue is being discussed. Uh, our campaign has, uh, uh, you know, has created fascination across the globe. I mean, certainly at least the Trump phenomenon. And there was no escaping these issues that deal with Islam and Muslims. These are hot issues of the day. Uh, and, uh, and clearly, a lot of people don't follow the nuance. Even here, I think a lot of people <clears throat> might be surprised by the results, because that's not what we get when we, when we look at the discourse. We're not tracing it. Uh, but there is a discourse out there. Absolutely. And it's not necessarily one that is informed about us, uh, or uh, uh, even about the nature of the discourse that we're having here. Uh, so what I would like to do is, is, is ask, ask uh, one broad question to each one of you. Uh, what does it look like in Iran? What does it look like in Egypt and the Arab world? What does it look like in Turkey? I mean, these representative regions and countries in, in Muslim-majority countries. Uh, so let me start with you, Fatima, and thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Uh, yes, um, just given the short time that we, we have to address this, very complex and very large issue. I would like to say that um, the, the, the issue of, of how Iranians feel and follow what is going on in the United States and vice versa, unfortunately, is very much affected and comes under the umbrella of conflict. If you want to know, you know what, what I mean, I think one uh, tangible example would be that you would probably not see me after this. I'll be for you the Iranian woman who addressed the issue related to Islamophobia. 
So in that way, um, it, that this kind of exclusive approach that's related to conflict is on both sides, happening on both sides. Um, so much so that I actually developed an, a, a, an answer when people say, who do you vote for in this election? I say, whoever can make three sentences about Iran, which does not have the word terrorism, conflict, or nuclear in it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think that, that explains the broader point I have. So these conflicts within Iran are, from, from, first, from the American point of view, the most major one is the hostage taking that takes place right after the Islamic Revolution in Iran. Prior to that, Iran and US are big allies. The flag burnings, the calling of the US, the great Satan, and, and uh, you know, very painful um, anti-American slogans, which did happen very fervently during that time period. And um, then, of course, came the discussion of the axis of evil, um, right after Iran had played a part, a very important part, in the negotiations between the US and the Afghans um, in, in Afghanistan, and actually um, soon after th that had helped with the arrest of Saddam Hussein. So there were, ish there were moments where, at least in Iran, people were feeling there are openings where there could be uh, less of a kind of hostile and conflict-ridden relationship between the two countries, but they didn't happen. They were very frustrating in that sense. And then, of course, began the uh, nuclear uh, negotiations, which then really overshadowed <coughs> everything for a, for a very long time. That's the only thing you see about Iran. Now, in Iran, if you look at it, one other event is added to this, and that's in 1952, a major coup takes place that ousts the Iranian, the democratically elected Iranian Prime Minister, Mohammad Mossadegh. And with that comes the rule of the Shah, which, which was happening before too, but after that becomes uh, completely authoritarian and, and so forth. Now, having this, um, and, and of course I have to say one more thing, the, the Iran-Iraq war. When the attack on, the, on Iran begins in 1980, um, the U.S. comes across as a major ally of Saddam. Even, you know, this is, uh, I'm talking about perceptions. And um, to what extent every detail is substantiated is a, is a different issue. But definitely the perception from the media and from what you hear is that, you know, the, the, the West, this big mass, uh, the West, and particularly the U.S., is very supportive of that, despite the use of chemical weapons and all of that. Okay, so if you put all of this together in the background and take a very broad look at the um, politics in Iran all the way until 1979, the Iranian government is pretty much pro-Republican. Republicans want good business. They don't care about human rights. They don't, you know, they don't really press you um, on such uh, unpleasant issues. You and mean that's the perception the there? Percep that, again, the perception, again, there. you're not saying they don't care. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. that's the perception. Well, and, and, and I think for most, the most part, for example, if you look at the relationship between Shaw and, mm -hmm. and Richard Nixon, I mean, that is, that is the case. But of course, you cannot uh, say that across the Republican um, uh, scene, that everybody feels that way. Um, so, when, and then the revolution happens. When the revolution happens, the anti-American feeling really um, gets translated into um, the foreign policy of the U.S. is going to be the same. Whoever is elected, Democrat or Republican, are going to be the same. So that, again, that's a perception. That's, you can go to a um, specialized political publication into a classroom and get far more nuanced analysis of American politics. But that doesn't really filter into the general public media. The public media is much more focused on the, the broad perception of this anti-Iranian, which is going to be understood to be the same. Now, um, when the Trump-Clinton um, pair of uh, opponents start. 
The Iranian um, general discourse of the, of the media in Iran is more favorable to Trump. The idea is that he's a businessman, he wants to make good deals, he really knows we don't have nuclear weapons. Everybody, Regardless of what he says about Islam and no, Muslims. No, that's mm. at the beginning. Okay. That's at the beginning. So, and, and, and of course the perception is all this whole accusations of building nuclear bombs is of course in order to paint us with an unfavorable brush. They know that. He wants to make good deals. He's going to work with us. And this is again the broad public opinion, not the politicians have a more nuanced and a more uh, specific for or against. As various debates take place, that gradually changes, but the change also has another explanation. Hillary Clinton goes through a transformation. In 2008, Clinton says, if Iran poses a threat to Israel, we will obliterate Iran. We will obliterate Iran. That's a 70 million person country. So at that, so every, nobody has any doubts about the hawkish position of Clinton on Iran, but then in the uh, back and forth that takes place between Bernie Sanders and Clinton and making, you know, Clinton bringing the left closer, a number of things happen on, you know, minimum wage and other things, and one of them is to actually support President Obama's negotiations with Iran, and as you have all heard, she has been defending it without firing a shot that has, that has happened. So um, these two events, these two changes, and, and with that, Trump gets more and more and more anti-Islamic, anti-Iran in particular. I mean, the number of times he talks about how rich Iranians are because of the room full of cash that was being given to them and so forth. Um, so that, those, are, those are treated actually as jokes in Iran. You know, in the papers they appear as jokes, but nonetheless, um, I think now, right now in Iran, it, although I'm again being very, very general, but I would like to end with this, that you, it, it would be fair to say that the general public opinion is pretty much anti-Trump, except for the hardliners who see him as an opportunity to show who really the United States is. Mm -hmm. He's the one who actually shows the, the, the real, the true feeling, and the other ones are hiding their feelings. So in that sense, that there are things that, 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 that come out. And in, interestingly enough, opinions like this were expressed about Ahmadinejad in Iran before, when certain more right-wing people said he should get elected because he really represents the the nastiness of the, you know, of the mm -hmm. people over there. So it's a, it's a yeah. similar. Very yeah. interesting. Now, Sahar, if I may ask you the same question, but I want to just add um, a little bit. Um, now, you know, Fatima said, obviously, there were people who were initially attracted to Trump. That's true in the Arab world, mm -hmm. even now, actually. Many of the rulers actually think, you know, this is all rhetoric, but they can do business with him. Mm -hmm. uh, and even on Islam and Muslims, there are people in the Arab world, particularly around the secular elites, who, who, who do have a phobia of, of political Islam, period. Uh, so they, they're, it's not just that we, hear, you know, we have it here, but, but there, some people even say there's no difference between peaceful Islamists and militant Islamists because they're all alike. We hear that. In, so how is that playing itself out in, in Egypt and the Arab world? Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's indeed an honor and a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, and thanks, Dr. Talhami, for the invitation. Of course, you said we all appear in the media, but we're the one who appears the most in the media, more than the rest of us. We're jealous of you for that. <laughs> That's just an Egyptian joke here. So, <laughs> just in case you did not get an Egyptian joke. Islamophobia is very much in the eyes of the beholder. So when we talk about the term like Islamophobia, what makes people Islamophobic, and how do people react to the notion of Islamophobia. It very much depends on who we're talking about. So let me just start briefly by explaining how this whole notion of Islamophobia is different for Muslims living here inside the United States and Muslims in, let's say, Egypt or the rest of the Arab world, because there's definitely a distinction that needs to be made here. 
With the rise of Islamophobia in this country, we witnessed three important waves of Islamophobia. The first one was after the Iran hostage crisis. The second one was after the September 11th attacks. And the third one was after the attacks in San Bernardino in California and in Orlando and Paris. And I said this morning in my Arab media course that the third wave of Islamophobia has been by far the most vicious and the most aggressive one, and it has been much more amplified than other waves. Some of my students disagreed with me. They thought that it's the second one, it is the one after 9-11 that was the worst. I said, we're not talking here about better or worse, we're talking about the loudest, the most vicious, and the most highly amplified. And the word amplified is very important because the power of social media and new media now means that if you put something online, it's gonna fly very quickly. It's gonna be tweeted and retweeted in a split of a second, and that definitely increases the scale and the outreach and also the impact and the amplification of the message of Islamophobia. But it can also be seen as a double-edged sword. Just like it can spread Islamophobia, it can also be used sometimes by Muslims to counter Islamophobia and to try to create their own narratives and counter narratives online. And indeed, there is some evidence of that as well. But let me go back to how it's impacting Muslims in the US versus abroad. In the US, definitely Muslims have been feeling the impact of this vicious wave of Islamophobia very, very much. You know, with presidential candidate, uh, you know, Trump saying things like, Islam hates us. He did not say, you know, some Muslims hate us or some extremist Muslims hate us. He said, Islam hates us. And I don't know how much you know about Arab humor and Egyptian sense of humor, but the word Islam also can be a man's name. So one of my friends on Twitter said, why would my cousin Islam hate us? <laughs> There's absolutely no reason for him to do so. So even the use of unsophisticated terms like that in a very collective sense without any kind of explanation of the context or what it means creates this kind of very sarcastic, you know, funny but bitterly funny kind of reaction from American Muslims. American Muslims have been very worried about their own safety and rightly so. There have been an increased number of attacks on mosques, Islamic centers, individuals. I myself, as a Muslim woman wearing the hijab, for the very first time in nine years living here in the US, I faced an Islamophobic incident when I was approached by a man on the street who saw me reaching to my purse and shouted in my face, are you getting out a gun? Are you getting out a gun? And I quickly said to myself, I'm gonna pretend I don't understand a word of English, <laughs> which I did, so I just walked by him very calmly you know, nothing, as if he did not say anything, and he did not know how to react to me. So he started, you know, cursing and cussing and using dirty words. I still, I did not understand anything he said, so I just kept walking very calmly. But of course, I was very scared from the inside because I did not know how he's going to react and whether this is going to turn into a physically violent attack. So for this to happen for the first time in nine years shows you the impact of this kind of dangerous rhetoric hate speech and Islamophobia. There have been instances of attacks on mosques and Islamic centers and Muslim women wearing the hijab. And Muslims are now in the US asking questions like, what's gonna happen to my immigration status? Am I gonna be granted the American citizenship or not? What's gonna happen to my application? They're very worried if uh, you know, someone like Trump gets the White House, what kind of effect could this have on their own civil rights and human rights? And I'm a commissioner on the Human Rights Commission in Montgomery County, Maryland. So we do get you know, communities of people. We talk, we have town hall meetings with them, and we hear what people have to say firsthand. It is very scary uh, indeed. They're also worried about things like civil rights in this country in general, practicing religious freedom in general, uh, things like the Syrian refugee crisis, you know, the idea of just blocking or simply closing the door in front of immigrants uh, altogether, and making sure Muslims have to really uh, check their own uh, convictions as well as their loyalty and patriotism. You have to pass a test that shows us how patriotic and how loyal and how American are you. All of these things are issues impacting American Muslims very seriously and very dangerously, and they're very, very worried uh, watching the elections. But let me tell you just quickly, they're also starting to, gra to craft very interesting responses to this uh, heightened wave of Islamophobia online and offline. And I say every cloud has a silver lining and that has been the silver lining in this cloud. Uh, off, uh, offline in the real world, there is now an increased degree of Muslim political engagement that is unwitnessed before. You know, American Muslims have not been as engaged in the political process as they should have been. This year is very different. 
Almost every mosque, every Islamic center has centers for registering Muslim voters and they're taking it very seriously this time to go to the polls and to cast a ballot and to cast their vote because they feel it is really to be or not to be. It is a matter of a very serious election that can really have very direct and very dangerous effects and impacts on them and their families. So that is, a, in my opinion, a positive thing that came out of all of this darkness. Online, they started social media campaigns like hashtag Muslims are speaking out, which is basically Muslims across the board, scholars, journalists, uh, average people saying we are against terrorism, we're against violence, that does not define us. ISIS is not Islam, it does not speak for who we are. We're 1.6 billion Muslims who are kind-hearted, hard-working, professional people, we help our families, we love our community, and so on. But most interestingly, they also created campaigns responding directly to Trump and to Trump's rhetoric which I find to be very interesting. So when he criticized Mrs. Khan, we all know the incident, of course, during the Democratic National Convention, when the father and mother of the American soldier who lost his life defending this country were on stage. And he said, and look at his wife. She was even standing there silent, and she had nothing to say. Probably she was even not allowed to speak. What did Muslim women do, including myself? We took to Twitter and started a campaign, hashtag, can you hear us now? And the campaign was directed directly as, at Mr. Trump, right? So we, we started things like, you know, uh, I'm a professional, I'm a professor, can you hear me now? You know, I said something like, Muslims speak out against all violence and hatred and terrorism, and they speak out against hate speech against them. So Mr. Trump, can you hear us now? So that's a campaign that many Muslim women activists started. They also started a campaign called hashtag Muslims report stuff which is very interesting. In the, in the second presidential debate, when a Muslim woman stood on stage and she asked Trump the question, what about Islamophobia? And he answered with an Islamophobic answer when he told her, well, Muslims should report stuff. You see something, you say something. So as if basically we are very much suspected and very suspicious people, and we should have the responsibility on our shoulders to report stuff. So they started the campaign, hashtag, Muslims report stuff like, you know, my mother cooks the very same food every day and I'm reporting her now. My brother never makes up his room. I'm reporting him to the FBI. Please come and catch him, uh, you know, catch him now and things like that. So they turned it into, again, a bitterly sarcastic campaign that tells us a lot. That is the situation in terms of how things look like for the American Muslim community. Now, how does it look like in Egypt and in the rest of the Arab world? Again, Islamophobia is in the eyes of the beholder. It depends on who you are and where you are on the map, both geographically and demographically, to tell us how you think about these issues. Overall, there has been a very high level of apprehension about this particular presidential election, and rightly so. It has been seen as very unusual, and it has been, as very, very unique and different from any other previous presidential election. There's been a lot of discussion about things ranging from whether there is a real difference between the two candidates or whether the difference is really all about rhetoric and choice of language and words. This is one thing they talked about. They talked about whether there's going to be a real change in American foreign policy or not. And that's a very important point that keeps coming up a lot in the coverage of this particular election in the Egyptian media and in the Arab media in general. Basically, do you think this has been a unique election because you know, there is really an unprecedented level of Islamophobia for sure, but also uh, discrimination against, you know, all different groups, as, you know, as Trump in his talk did not only speak out against Muslims, but Muslims, Latinos, women, uh, you know, African Americans, uh, immigrants in general, people with disabilities, women, I don't know who is left except white American men, pro probably, but every other category has been attacked by him. And they saw this as very, very alarming and very dangerous rhetoric. Now, what about foreign policy, which has been the main concern in the Arab press and the Egyptian press? They see that there is no real significant difference to be expected in terms of American foreign policy. They think there will be some stable and constant trends and patterns in American foreign policy that are not likely to change no matter who is going to come to the White House. Support for Israel is going to remain the same. The U.S. will continue to adopt a pro-Israeli policy no matter who comes to the White House. Support for dictatorial regimes in the Arab world, and that's a very painful point, 
they think it's going to remain the same no matter who comes to the White House. Because they had a lot of high expectations that after the Arab Spring movements in 2011 and after deposing dictators from office, that the American foreign policy is going to change and they're not going to support new dictators coming to office. And that has not happened. And they said, well, if Obama cannot change this policy, it is much, much less likely that other candidates who are going to come to the White House are going to change the policy. So they don't think Clinton will do it. And of course, definitely not Trump. So that is something that has been very clear in their commentary and discussion. They also saw the Arab world as simply uh, you know, seen from the element of instrumentalization and objectification. So they said, we Arabs and Muslims are being instrumentalized and objectified. And even the language itself, which is being used, really signifies this strategy and this policy. We are not being seen with respect or looked at as partners, but rather as uh, elements of uh, you know, instrumentalization and objectification. The only difference in their opinion is the way it is being said. So they said that Trump has a much more bold, aggressive, in your face kind of attitude. He just says it as it is in your face. And of course, he talks about things like oil. We should have taken the oil. Like basically, we should have steal, stolen your oil and gun. You know, uh, if you want us to protect you, make sure you pay your bills. So you have to pay the bill in order to be protected. Uh, you know, it's very, very bold and very aggressive and very uh, uh, outspoken. They think of Clinton as not necessarily having a drastically or dramatically different foreign policy, but they see her as the more experienced partner, of course, because she is the one who was the Secretary of State, the First Lady, uh, a senator before. So she knows how to choose diplomatically, uh, you know, quoted and uh, very diplomatically crafted words. She is more sophisticated, she is more nuanced, she is more experienced, and she is more diplomatic. Now, whether this is going to translate into real differences in terms of foreign policy or relationship between the U.S. and the Arab world and the Muslim world, the answer from many commentators and political analysts is no. Yeah. In fact, one of them sarcastically said, it's the difference between Pepsi-Cola and Coca-Cola. You get different brand names, but you can get the same content yeah. oftentimes. Thanks so much for, for that uh, uh, wonderful uh, summary. Uh, Nil Tzu, um, uh, uh, I'd like to ask you the same question. And, and I, you know, particularly you know, when we focus on Turkey, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about how the Muslim world sees this discourse that we have about Islam and Muslims, but there's so much change taking place in, in Muslim countries, including civil wars, including devastation, including fights between secularists and Islamists in each one, including a discourse about Islam within, within each of the countries, whether it's in Egypt, but certainly in Turkey, particularly in light of the coup attempt. Uh, and, and so how does it look like uh, in the context of that division that you have in Turkey? Thank you, Dr. Tahami, and thank you all for joining us today, and my fellow panelists who already covered most of the things that I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I feel like Turkey gets hit most by the narrative because it's both a Muslim country and a NATO member. So uh, the Turkish perspectives on the current election and um, the current state of the uh, Turkish-US relations are heavily impacted by the July 15th attempt at coup and also how the results of the election and the next president are going to uh, change this dynamic in the bilateral relationship as well as the US foreign policy towards the Middle East. Um, and August, New York Times uh, editorial actually argued that in the aftermath of the coup, Turkey is no longer a trusted ally of the U.S. due to this increased sense of anti-Americanism. But it's important to ask, is this something new? Uh, and where do these sentiments come from? Uh, for the most part, the anti-American sentiment comes from the coup attempt itself uh, and the argument that the culprit of the coup attempt resides in the U.S. Fethullah Gülen, who is a self-exiled imam uh, residing in Pennsylvania, and according to the Turkish government, he is, uh, his terrorist organization is behind the coup attempt. And Turkey has officially requested his extradition. So it's a tough decision in the U.S.-Turkish relationship that the next president will have to address. And obviously, the Turkish government is keen on knowing who this next president is going to be. Uh, but uh, government-influenced media sources in the right aftermath of the coup attempt have focused on the U.S. as the primary enemy, 
arguing that there would have been no way that the U.S. didn't know about the coup attempt because Gulen simply lives in the U.S. And the fact that the U.S. and other NATO allies remained silent in the aftermath also made it quite difficult uh, in the minds of the Turkish uh, officials. The second main issue is the divergence of interests in the fight against ISIS. And this is in particular the divergence of interests between U.S. and Turkey in Syria and Iraq. Turkey categorizes the PKK and the PYD as uh, both the same terrorist organization and heavily criticizes the U.S. Uh, assistance to Kurdish forces. And the, in the recent uh, rounds of debates, uh, Secretary Clinton made it very clear that she will continue the policy to support uh, Kurdish forces in the fight against ISIS, which became extremely unpopular within Turkish circles. And I would like to add that this idea of a new anti-Americanism is not new. It's since the day Turkey became a member of uh, NATO. Um, Turkey has always been one of the Muslim countries with the highest unfavorable opinion of the US. And actually, a Pew Research in 2014 found that only 19% of the Turkish po uh, public is favorable of uh, NATO. But it's important to add that this unpopularity hasn't reflected on uh, Turkish policy making in any way, at least until so far. So coming to Turkey's views on uh, this rhetoric and the narrative on Islamophobia and immigrant phobia, obviously President Erdogan sees a huge role for himself in the Islamic world to be the a uh, person who is going to come over this clash of civilizations argument. And uh, it has epically failed in many ideological terms uh, in terms of his regional policies. Um, but in the sense that uh, uh, Turkey has an Islamist government, of course, they are extremely concerned about the increased Islamophobic rhetoric, both in the US and also in Europe. And President Erdogan actually came here to open up the Islamic Center here in Greenbelt last April. And he did uh, make a reference to Trump's uh, statements without naming him and by saying that they are ready to uh, take an active role in this fight. But it's also important to note that the Gulen movement is a lot more organized than the AKP movement in the US. So it's going to be tough for them to replace the organizations that have been uh, uh, functioning within the US circles over the years in order to fight Islamophobia. So in terms of the secular uh, voices who have been following the elections, the idea is pretty much the same that there's not going to be much of a change. If not, uh, the Clinton presidency would be even worse than the Obama administration for Turkey's regional interests. They also argue that uh, Trump's rhetoric, much like that's the case in Iran, might be favorable to AKP movement because of its populist tendencies. Of course, this doesn't include the ban of uh, Muslims or exporting them, but when it comes to the populist rhetoric, uh, seculars criticize the AKP movement by saying that they have similarities in terms of the rhetoric. The conservative voices focus more on uh, Clinton and the possibility that uh, the Clinton uh, campaign actually received a huge amount from uh, the Gulen movement. So that's why it has become even politicized outside the US in terms of the campaign support. Uh, they also expect Clinton's foreign policy towards the region to be a continuation of the Obama administration and not favorable in terms of Turkey's interests. Uh, and they argue that uh, the reason why the U.S. did not respond to the coup attempt is a form of Islamophobia, because um, the conservative AKP voices in Turkey uh, uh, argued that the reason why the U.S. did not believe in this movement is because they didn't believe in a democracy functioning in a Muslim society. And here they refer to President Erdogan's call to people to go out on the street to defend democracy against the coup attempt. So I'd like to finish by uh, making a remark that actually Turkey has a similar narrative and discussion that mimics the US version of mm. immigrant phobia and Islamophobia when it comes to accepting more Syrian refugees. And as you, of you mean the domestic rhetoric? Yeah. yeah. The domestic rhetoric in the US resembles the domestic rhetoric in Turkey, even though the reasoning might be a little bit different because in Turkey, uh, as of September 2016, as of a couple um, weeks ago, 
uh, in small southeastern Turkey cities, the population uh, ratio could go up to 25%. And this creates a huge issue in terms of whether Turkey should stop accepting more Syrian refugees. But uh, a 2014 poll actually found that 86% argue that Turkey should stop accepting more Syrian refugees. They differ in the methods. Some argue that there should be a cap, uh, which is the majority, 31%. 29% uh, argue that they should stop immediately. And uh, the reasons are not as nuanced as in your polls, whether it comes to security issues, but I feel like it's mostly economic reasons that Turkey can no longer um, accept more refugees. And uh, this is the public opinion. Uh, this opinion is not as divided in the foreign policy experts there. Only 34% argue that Turkey should stop taking refugees. Mm -hmm. Great, well, thanks so much. Uh, I was gonna go with a round of questions, uh, but since we have only 15, 20 minutes, I would like to go right to the audience and, and forego my own questions. So if you have a question, uh, please your, raise your hand and uh, right there, and the microphone will come to you. Uh, the, the gentleman in the green shirt was the first one to raise his hand. Uh, do we, can we um, bring the microphone to him? Right there. Thank you. Uh, Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, first off, uh, thank you so much to the Omar Sadat Chair uh, for Peace and Development, as well as the School of Public Policy, uh, and all, of course the panelists uh, for coming out here to UMD today, and uh, for all the students in the community here. Um, Mr. Talhami, um, last semester uh, the Egyptian ambassador, as you may have recalled, uh, to the to the U.S. Uh, ambassador Sam Ashokri uh, came right here uh, to the University of Maryland. And uh, uh, no, it was actually the former ambassador. Oh, excuse Nabi me. Yes, the, for, yes yeah. the former. Yes, the former, which was former ambassador. Right, former Nabi Nabi family. Yeah, yeah. So sorry. Uh, former ambassador, current foreign minister uh, of Egypt, uh, Samar Shokri, uh, came over and talked about uh, uh, the politics in the region. Uh, Mr. Shokri alluded to his administration's uh, political disagreements with uh, President Obama during the discussion, if you recall. Uh, one of those disagreements uh, was how the Egyptian government uh, should handle the fundamentalists in the region. Uh, that being said, is there, in your opinion, any justification within uh, American uh, political discourse to designate certain Muslims as, quote, uh, fundamentalists or radical uh, uh, Muslims? And if so, should Americans object to this ideology that the uh, ambassador seems to be uh, alluding to? Okay, um, uh, you're, you're referring to uh, a visit by Mr. Nabid Fahmi. Uh, who was um, at one point the ambassador here and then later became the foreign minister of Egypt. He was the previous foreign minister. He's not currently the foreign minister. Um, but he was one of the most respected diplomats in the Arab world period, actually. He's uh, very experienced. Uh, what he was referring to, of course, was that uh, in American foreign policy, uh, this issue of what to do about Islamic movements and political Islam particularly is a major one. And certainly it has become a big one uh, after uh, the Arab uprisings, especially in Egypt, Tunisia, and elsewhere, uh, where uh, Islamic, uh, Islamist movements did well in elections, uh, and how the, Ameri how the United States would approach them. Um, so um, there, there is definitely, separate from the issue of human rights, which the U.S. obviously has a position on, uh, in, the, in, in, in the way uh, uh, governments and regimes deal with their populations, uh, there is a philosophical, uh, you know, uh, kind of dif dif uh, difference of opinion uh, on whether it's best to allow political Islamist groups to, to, be, to participate in politics. Yes, let's say what happened in Jordan, where they're incorporated um, up to a point within the parliament and, and they're, you know, that that might be ultimately more, dis more stabilizing than keeping them completely out. There are people in, in the Arab world, including the current Egyptian government, that feel that political Islam itself is no such thing as peaceful political Islam. So when you talk about the Muslim Brotherhood, 
uh, they, they argue that it's just a, a matter of time before they become violent, or they have become violent. Uh, they think that political Islam is necessarily or ultimately a violent one. And they, so they're, so the, the reason I ask that question here about the debate in the Arab world, it's not just here in our country. Those debates take place even in places like Egypt, and they are taking place right now, and certainly in Turkey as well, among some of the secularists. Uh, and so, yeah, there is a difference of opinion, because I think the adopted view, certainly by uh, the mainstream in the US, and one can argue the democratic mainstream, is that if you go all out and keep what the US estimates to be a pretty substantial portion of the population, even if you say it's only 20% of the population, 15% of the population, we talk about a country like Egypt uh, of possibly 90 million people, uh, that's a, a lot of people. Uh, so the US, uh, certainly the Obama administration position, I think uh, uh, Secretary Clinton's position, uh, Secretary Kerry's position has been that you can't keep them out without ultimately forcing them to become more militant. That's an American approach. That's not shared by every rule in the Arab world. And that's a subject of debate. That's what he was referring to. Can I just make a small comment quickly here? Sure, absolutely. Even within you know, Egypt itself, many parts of the Arab world, there isn't exactly an eye-to-eye -eye agreement as to what constitutes, you know, quote-unquote, maybe political Islam or how dangerous would the political Islamists be if they get to power or how should we handle them or deal with them. So there's a lot of division of public opinion. Like, for example, if you talk about the liberals, right, the liberals or the seculars, many of them said, you know, okay, we do not necessarily feel uh, good about political Islam being in power, but at the same time, we do not feel good about members of the Muslim Brotherhood being you know, killed or arrested or harassed or intimidated or put in jail by the thousands, tens of thousands of political prisoners and human rights violations. So it's a very tricky issue because there's definitely a disagreement and a division of opinion as to how to best handle it. Mm -hmm. But overall, there's dissatisfaction with the U.S. position because there's a feeling like there should have been more uh, you know, involvement in terms of ending human Human rights violations. And again, it's a tricky issue because the U.S. is oftentimes in the tricky position of damned if you do and damned if you don't. If you interfere, how much should you interfere? And if you don't interfere, you get blamed for not interfering. So I'm not saying, it's not suggesting there's any easy black or white, yes or no, right or wrong answer. No, no. I'm just showing the complexity right. of and this situation. In fact, as you know, in the case of Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood accuses the Obama administration of being behind the coup. And uh, certainly the uh, President Sisi and, and many of his supporters, and certainly people who support among the elites, accuse the U.S. of supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. And this is Exactly. And to make things even we, more awkward, yeah. you know, there are those who blame the U.S. for standing behind the Brotherhood. And right. I'm like, you know, wait a minute. What is yeah. going on here? Like you're hearing all of these narratives and counter-narratives, stories and counter-stories, and before you know it, you're completely confused about it. Yeah. Fatima, you have some. Yeah. No, I just wanted to use this opening to say that one of the most important issues with regards to this election with Iran is also the same, or a shade of the same issue that uh, the reformists and what the government of President Rouhani has been able to achieve, not that it has achieved everything it was hoping to achieve, but a little bit of opening and uh, strengthening of the civil society and so forth, all of that is really, um, um, it, it, it's going to, it, it's in question. It's, uh, they're waiting to see, in, Iran has an ele a general election about six months after the American election. So um, the reformists are very much worried about that a kind of a Trump government and a, a damage to the relationship between Iran and the U.S. could be really um, lethal for the, for the reformist movement, which has been struggling to, to, uh, to not lose strength. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my name is Amal David. I am with Arab America. It's a, a media company in Washington, D.C., national, international company. The reason I want to speak first to thank each one of you, and especially Dr. Shibli Talhami, thank you so much for Pleasure. outstanding session and discussion like this. Uh, my question is, what recommendation would you give to young people like this? beautiful audience, and this is exactly, this is America. What suggestion would you give them to help their uh, colleagues, uh, other uh, young people or older people from different religions, especially Muslims, to 
make them feel more comfortable and safer. Okay, we'll take one more question from Gary and then we'll, go, we'll answer two at a time. We'll take then one final round uh, after that. Gary. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Garrett Mitchell and um, I write the Mitchell Report and I, <clears throat> I want to pose a question and also say at the outset I'm going to leave it to Dr. Telhami to determine whether this is the right question for this forum, but mm -hmm. let me go ahead and say it anyway. I've been sitting here looking at this title, Islamophobia in the American Elections, and wondering w what, would, what discussion we might have if we kind of turned that around and uh, talked about Americaphobia <clears throat> in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and as I think about that, uh, the question that comes up for me as I listen to these three very interesting yeah. perspectives from three different places is um, if it is fair to say that, that uh, Amer America phobia is pretty rampant uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the parts of the world that you represent uh, in, in terms of your, uh, uh, in, in terms of particularly as you're, as you're addressing it today, um, what, what is it about America uh, that accounts for that phobia? Mm -hmm. what, what, are, what, what are the things that, um, uh, that have gotten us to that point as far as you're concerned? And mm -hmm. are they something that can be addressed in the context uh, of a 45th presidency, or are these much longer term? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's start with uh, anyone who wants to address Amal's uh, question. Thank you for the question, Amal. That's a very good question indeed. And I always say that today we have uh, what we can call the golden triangle. The golden triangle is grassroots mobilization, investing in young people, in youth, and deploying social media and new media. These are very, very three important dimensions. If we invest in these three things, grassroots activism, youth mobilization, and new media, we can make a lot of difference. And just like I give some examples today of social media campaigns that have been started online to try to counter Islamophobia and present a different story and a different narrative, these things are very important. The internet can be a double-edged sword. It can help to spread Islamophobia and bigotry and hatred, but it can also help to counter Islamophobia and hatred and bigotry of all forms. So that's why I'm saying invest in young people, give them more education, uh, help them to become masters of their own techniques and skills and tools, and help them to get online and to spread the message in a very effective way. And one uh, quick example that I did not give, but it's very funny, is a campaign called Islamophobin. And Islamophobin is supposed to be a pill. If you take it three times a day, your Islamophobia should immediately disappear. So it's another campaign that was started online as well. Check it out. It's called the Islamophobin pill. Okay, so these are examples that might seem funny, but they're very telling mm -hmm. when you think about the meaning behind them. Well, there, there is, a, you know, I have a, 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 a quick recommendation, which I, I, I generally have for all students, which is study abroad. Don't graduate before studying abroad. Take another language. Uh, uh, connect with internationals. Uh, uh, you know, you can see, you, can, you know, data speaks for itself. And, and just to go back to Gary's point, the same is true in, in the Arab world. As you know, I study Arab public opinion as well and do polling in the Arab world. And, and you're right, uh, there is a, an American phobia. Uh, uh, you know, people have seen America as the other in, in, in the relationship. Uh, but even there, when you look at the data and try to see people who speak English, people who visited the US, people who know Americans, they tend to have a more favorable view. Not necessarily a great view, but certainly a more favorable view uh, than, than the rest. Uh, I happen to think that you're onto something in asking that question in a bigger way. Uh, yeah, I think in the past um, uh, couple of decades, perhaps since the end of the Cold War, but certainly since 9-11, certainly since 9-11, uh, if identity is defined in relation to another, that always is, uh, political identity, I think, I think Muslims have become the other for the American identity. And to some extent, America has become the other for much of the Arab and Muslim identity until the Arab uprisings and, and the entanglement inside. And that, that in some ways you find that, obviously because of, 
when we say Americans are making, they don't know Muslims, and they're making their judgment based on the horrific things that they're witnessing, whether it's 9-11 or attacks or, or violence in the region or whatever it is, that's how they are going to make their mind. Arabs are going to make their mind bases of American airplanes um, attacking in Iraq or Afghanistan or, or support for Israel or, or something, or support dictators or, or whatever it is that we do that they will that will frame their identity. And in fact, in, in my book, The World Through Our Bodies, I've argued that part of the rise of Islamic identity is not just that that's been intense at some level, but part of it for a lot of people has been an increase in the number of people who interpreted American foreign policy after 9-11 as anti-Muslim, that the war on terrorism, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, were seen to be anti-Muslim in a way that bolstered a sense of Islamic identity. And then after the Arab uprising, that went down a little bit. And in fact, in some ways, globalist identity increased, particularly as Americans sympathized with the early, early days of the Arab uh, uprising. And we see in the data here and there among young people who are connected, the millennials, particularly ones that I've studied uh, in, in one of these polls, we did an oversample of millennials. Um, the millennials have a greater uh, global identity. They're more likely to say, uh, I'm a citizen of the world uh, than the rest of the population. Uh, and, and, and that's true even we found in, in, in the Arab world, increasing number uh, early in the early days of the Arab uprising. So yes, I think it's a dynamic relationship. And it's good to look at it that way because I think it, it does add information. Um, I, I would like to just add that first I bribed him to say something about language teaching because I'm from the right. School of Language. <laughs> so I said, I'll come if you say you have to all learn Persian and Arabic, so thank you. <laughs> and, and Turkish, of course. Um, so I wanted to say something that's very relevant to that. Um, I would say to my students and my friends and my colleagues, meet one Muslim. Just find, I mean, I agree with everything that Sahar said, going online, you know, mobilizing and all that, but make a point of meeting one real person. And that would connect you with another way of thinking, with another, you know, and then you will soon begin to see a lot more similarities than differences. And I would like to get back to the point that you made, I think that um, the only uh, part that I would change in what uh, Shibley said, I wouldn't say that the identity is global here and even there. I would say there, the sometimes even stronger uh, movements towards globalization. I mean, yeah. Iranians are number four bloggers in the world. I'm not surprised if you never heard that, because again, as I said, it's only in the context of Islamophobia or Iranophobia that we can have a conversation. And so, um, Yes, there is this, and I would say the key here is a more of a structural change. Yes, of course, we have to inform each other and we have to do that, but the demographics of the globe, the economic patterns of exchange, the information machines, all of that are changing the way we um, envision ourselves and others, and that is changing whether we like it or not. So we need to really try to use it to direct it in the, in the direction that we want. I think part of the answer to your question lies for the Turkish case with security assurances that the U.S. is not conspiring to divide Turkey. I would call it a West phobia due to the post-World uh, War I period that Turkey needs those reassurances when it comes to the Middle East. I think the short and difficult answer to your question is basically it's the American foreign policy. I mean, there's this saying that I always repeat that uh, people outside the U.S. do not hate the American people. They're just not particularly falling in love with the American foreign policy. And the proof of this is in many cases you see demonstrations and protests in many parts of the Arab world against American foreign policy. People take a break from the protest and they go to McDonald's and they drink Pepsi Cola and they wear blue jeans. They love American culture, they love American people. The problem is the foreign policy. And unless the foreign policy changes, if it does not change, you will not see a lot of change in the sentiments and the opinions of a lot of segments of the populations in many parts of the Arab world. It's the foreign policy which is really the key determinant of people's attitudes. And of course, when you get rhetoric like, Islam hates us, we don't want Muslims in the US, we're gonna tighten the immigration policy, we don't want Syrian refugees, that does not help at all in any way, shape or form the image of the US or the sentiment towards it abroad. Great, well, we're, we're running out of time, but I do wanna take one last round of two questions 
the, the gentleman there and the gentleman here, uh, two questions, last two questions. Make them short, please, because we're running out of time. Yeah, sorry, two quick questions. One was well, there one, was one question, please. One question. You choose. Mm -hmm. One question. Uh, there was a mention about um, you couldn't vote for a candidate who had mentioned. Uh, a little closer to you. You couldn't. Yeah, that's good. You guys hear me? Yeah. That uh, you couldn't vote for a candidate who had spoken about the nuclear deal or um, terrorism, in, I guess, with Iran. Um, do you think that that's a little unfair considering that they've been um, considered a state sponsor of terrorism by the State Department? Um, also, I was a little bit shocked and disgusted that you said that Republicans don't care about human rights. I think that's a little bit unfair. So, but you, you know, she she said that's, that's how, it, how how Republicans are seen there. She I, didn't say that's her own view. I think that, that she was said the view that's how the perception. she correct she she clarified that. I asked her to clarify. Yeah, and that's it's what. But uh, go ahead, there. Last last question, and then we'll go back to it. Uh, here's here's the microphone. Uh, thanks. Um, looking at the trajectory of the future Middle East, I would argue that um, there are two rising powers in our region, and that's Iran and Turkey. Um, those will be the two major players for the next 20, 30, and 40 years. Now, if you are advising President Clinton or President Trump um, post-election, um, what would be your recommendation? What kind of uh, foreign policy to pursue vis-a-vis -vis these two countries? So should the U.S. continue to try and mediate between those two, or should it leave them alone and try to let them fix the puzzle of the Middle East. I would like to address that point, which is, I think, somewhat related to the point you're making, too. I think it's the, the, the comment on, um, I will vote for a person who can make three sentences about Iran. It's a, it's a somewhat you know, humorous, and, and, and what I mean by that is somebody who knows something about the countries and the world that they're talking about. Because very often, these parts of the world are just reduced to that one particular issue. And that, even that particular issue is not something that is factually proven. You can see how Saddam changes from a hero into a demon. And you know that is over less than a period of a decade where he's been using the same chemical weapon on Iranians. He's not really called on what he's doing, but later on, very soon, he changes. So there is a lot of double standard in this foreign policy that people could feel it over there. I would advise the, uh, the, the, whoever's the president to approach the region with an a, attention to opportunities rather than threats. Iran is a tremendous opportunity. Turkey is a tremendous opportunity. You have to look at what can come out of building relationships with these parts of the world rather than containing them as threats constantly. Thank you. Any final comments? Yep. I would recommend that our future president takes Turkey's ambitions seriously, that it's going to be persistent, that those ambitions should translate into guarantees and reassurances towards Turkey's role within NATO. You did not mention Egypt as a player, so I'm, I think, off the hook for this question. <laughs> so it's only Iran and Turkey are going to be the future players, not my country. So okay. But I can just say that, in general, there is this you know, sense of looking forward to some kind of change in U.S. foreign policy, especially when it comes to dealing with dictatorial regimes, regimes that you know, have violations of human rights. There is hope that there's going to be more recognition of the power and talents and investment in the Arab people, in the Muslim people, who have so much to offer, not to see them as tools or instruments just for fighting terrorism or just for securing stability in the region or just more of the same foreign policy of the past, but rather seeing them with equity, justice, fairness, objectivity, respect, and that's very important. Dignity is what people are looking for, cooperation, investment in people, in human resources, and building a better future together. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I think, you know, no matter what we say or recommend to a new president, uh, uh, priorities are imposed uh, by a reality of public opinion and uh, change in the region. Uh, I think the Obama administration assumption that uh, uh, resolving the current uh, issues in the Middle East is not up to the United States of America is a good one. I think the American public sentiment that we don't want to see large deployments of troops in the region is a good one. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the tension between our commitment to democracy and human rights on the one hand 
and having work to work with rulers to bring about stability is not going to be resolved. And in fact, the, the biggest uh, uh, problem for an ex-president is prioritizing because uh, America simply can't deal with these issues on its own. And uh, it is going to have to decide what are the top priorities. For now, the public says it's ISIS. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that that's the way the priorities will be defined for the next president two years from today. Thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate you joining us for a great conversation. And hope to see you again. <laughs>